Weird Facts for Insomnia. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. I love how when humans get to play God, we immediately program our worst impulses into our creations. This robot can uh, have an affair with your wife, steal your children away, and probably wreck your car. So this episode is what happens when I don't follow my own rules. Oh, good? I had said that I would limit the amount of time that a topic could be voted on in the Discord. Uh. I was going to, like, shut down the voting after a few days. Because if two topics are neck and neck, uh-huh. if, you know, if it's the photo finish, at some point I have to call it and start researching one of them. Right. Because if I don't, we get what happened this week, which is that I get very deep into research for one specific subject, and then I go back and check the poll, and now the other one is winning. <laughs> and I panic. <laughs> but in this case, I actually, I checked back in the next day, and they were tied, and that was when I was like, all right, that's good enough, we're calling it. So what we're going to do, this week we're going to do the topic that was winning most of the time, and then next week we're going to do the topic, well, I guess two weeks from now, mm. we're going to do the topic that sort of briefly pulled ahead before falling back to a tie. Gotcha. So best of both worlds here. Everybody wins, mm. and uh, whichever one you voted for, you get it. And that actually works for me because I was equally excited about both of these topics. The one for today, I'm calling World's Fairs. A Legacy of Weirdness and Innovation. All right. I'm looking forward to it. So let's start with the fact that there is no such thing as a World's Fair. (laughs) And that's the end of the episode, folks. Thanks for tuning in. (laughs) That is just an American term that we Yanks have traditionally used. The official title of a so-called World's Fair, it's always some version of, like, international exposition. Mm. So I don't know if you've seen these, but there will be, like, World Expo or Global Exhibition. And the point is just what the name suggests to exhibit the achievements of participating nations. Hmm. I always imagine it's kind of like each country is one of those colorful birds doing a mating dance. They're like busting out their flashiest moves to outperform all of the rival birds. It's very chest beady. Mm, yes. Countries taking part in a world's fair are basically horny owls. <laughs> I was thinking more birds of paradise, but sure. Is the birds of paradise the one with the weird, like, looks like eyes on it, like a yep. little weird little mouth and stuff? And it goes, wanky, 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 wanky. Those are great. Yeah. I could watch that video over and over again. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's not my proudest fap. Nature's a real freak. Yeah. Tell yeah. Me. But these expos, they are a big deal with lots of money on the line, as we'll see. Mm. Many technological breakthroughs have been created for and or first debuted at these international expositions. For instance, electrical sockets debuted at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, and the Eiffel Tower was built for Paris's Exposition Universale in 1889. Huh. Okay. Universal. It sounds so fancy. A royale with cheese. <laughs> Even just the word exposition itself sounds more upscale and formal, but in America, we like to invoke the idea of a fair. It's more folksy. Yeah. Like maybe there would be a pig auction or something. I think it just sounds a bit more fun because, you know, getting to somebody to go to like an exposition on electricity and, and chemistry and maybe radiation or whatever. It sounds like a lot of lectures that people are just going to sleep through. Yeah, it sounds like someone's going to explain things to you yeah. long windedly. Mm. Too much exposition. Never a good thing. No. Get to the point. Yes. Speaking of which. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so world's fairs have only existed for a couple hundred years, but regular fairs have been around since pretty much forever. The Village Fair was a periodic festival or party celebrating harvests and religious holidays. There were also traveling fairs like carnivals and, of course, county fairs in the United States and the U.K., typically small regional rural events showcasing livestock and agriculture. That was where you could bid on a pig if you're into that kind of thing. Who isn't into pig? I mean, are you either a bacon or someone to warm your bed at night? The word fair itself typically implies a smallish gathering or celebration, which makes the concept of a world's fair counterintuitive. Yeah. The world is a big place. Fair is a small one, usually. Also, world is a big place. Never very fair. That too. Hmm. But the name sort of makes sense from a historical perspective, because the first gatherings that we might think of as precursors to the modern world's fair were in fact a lot smaller than they are now, and they weren't international. They were confined to one nation. Usually they were a type of flag-waving patriotic celebration of the country itself. Yes, nothing like a patriotic circle jerk to really celebrate what we what we really get down with. Yeah, kind of the worst things ever. Right? Yeah. <laughs> as soon as there's like way, too many flags, I'm uncomfortable. Right. You have yeah. too many flags, too many marching people. We are the best! Mm. Yeah, never good. Mm. Prague held one of these in 1791. France had a series of them starting in 1798, but exhibitions wouldn't go international until the 1800s. Hmm. 
One common feature of World's Fairs is the scale of construction. They typically involve giant pavilions for each country. It's kind of like Disneyland, how there's like Tomorrowland and Frontierland and Toonland or whatever. It's a French world after all. Yeah. At World's <laughs> Fairs, there's like France land and Canada land and Greenland land. It was too many lands, sir. <laughs> I don't think Greenland is. Greenland is actually part of Denmark. I just wanted to say Greenland land. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But these pavilions and other structures that are housing the events can be very impressive. Hmm. I don't know if you remember this. We talked about back in the Darwin Awards episode, possibly this is one of my first big lies, the Crystal Palace. It's a big glass house, and I claimed that it had eventually been destroyed by a guy with a wheelbarrow full of rocks. Yeah, that was. I did a couple of voices about that where I acted it out. Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. Well, that Crystal Palace, located in Hyde Park, London, was built to house the first true World's Fair, and I hadn't actually seen it until this episode. And let me tell you, I would give a high five to anyone who could take that thing down with rocks. <laughs> you would need a gigantic Angry Bird-style slingshot. A trebuchet, maybe? Yeah. Mm. Or just a machine gun. I was going to say, or a minigun, whatever. The building was massive. Mm. You can take an online virtual tour of this thing. I will link it in the show notes. It's very cool. Mm. It's basically a cavernous, elaborate greenhouse, like the size of an airplane hangar, made of iron and plate glass. Uh, at the time, it was the building with the greatest surface area of glass in the world. Hmm. And one benefit of the all-glass design, because it was transparent, no lighting was required during the day, which saved on electricity costs. Hmm. And those would have been significant, because it was big. Yeah. Caveat, the building was all-glass, except presumably for the area designated as the monkey closets. That was the nickname given to the first public toilets in England, installed in the Crystal Palace by plumber George Jennings. At least I'm assuming they weren't glass. That would give a whole new meaning to public exhibition. <laughs> I'm uh, Now I can't get that out of my head. D darling, I, I don't know that I want to go into this toilet. I, do, do lights come on and make it turn opaque? I want to go into it. It's called the monkey closet. I, it cost a, a, a cent to go yeah. in, and I bet there were a lot of disappointed patrons who came out <laughs> and were like, there's, there's just a toilet in there. There's what, not no a, fucking monkeys? Not a single monkey to be found. <laughs> this is bullshit. So more about the Crystal Palace. I did a deep dive into this place. It's very fascinating. Okay. It was modular, meaning it was constructed in segments that could be stacked, moved, and relocated. The building covered a total area of 18 acres. Uh, it really was an innovative and awe-inspiring structure. you got to take a look at this thing. Hmm. It also leaked like a sieve. Uh, when it rained, water poured through from over 1,000 of the building's metal and glass joints, and attempts to seal the leaks with putty were mostly ineffective and also, you know, aesthetically unappealing yeah i mean then it basically looked like someone sneezed all over the glass on the edges and yeah. then it's still leaking water so you're just like eh. kind of undercuts the grandeur mm. when you're basically holding the place together with like wads of chewing gum yeah this is the hallway of abc <laughs> we had the yep. wall of abc yes but not episode. not the expo of abc, of ABC. <laughs> saliva's from all over the world la la Still an impressive building, though. Yeah. You, you just want to visit on a sunny day. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> of which there are five in England. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the structure itself was big enough to contain a number of elm trees, so it was kind of like going uh, outdoors while you're indoors. I mean, sweet fuck, if it leaked that much, you wouldn't have to do much to water the trees, <laughs> would you? That was one benefit. Hmm. Yeah. This became a problem, though, when sparrows nested there, and it was impossible to shoot the sparrows because, you know, glass. Glass. <laughs> So the solution they came up with was to bring in sparrow hawks, and we have been down this road before with China and the four pests problem. Yeah. It never ends well. You bring in spiders to catch the flies, you bring in birds to catch the spiders, and eventually it's Jurassic Park. <laughs> and just, suddenly you have raptors and Tyrannosaurus rexes, and it's just all over the place. That's how it always goes. Yeah, uh, every time. According to the movies I have seen. <laughs> And what's funny to me is that I was originally thinking when you're describing this thing as 18 acres, like sort of in diameter, you know, whatever, covers 18 acres and it's glass. All I could think of was birds smacking into it. Yeah, I didn't really think of that. Mm. And from the inside and outside, yeah. especially like if a bird sees another bird from the inside and outside and then they, you know, they, they, they want to do their dance. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then they want to meet and it's a little more tragic. <laughs> or they want to fight and then it's just funny all around. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of my patch. Whap. Ooh. So the event that the Crystal Palace was built for, the first World's Fair, was officially known as the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, or just the Great Exhibition for short, and took place in 1851. It was the brainchild of Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, 
most famous for being the namesake of a horrific genital piercing that he supposedly created to pin down his gigantic penis so that it wouldn't show in trousers. Have you heard that urban legend? No, but I never, I, I just do, even hearing it, I don't believe it. It's, no, no. No, that's true that that is an urban legend. That's where the right. name comes from, mm -hmm. is that a guy wrote a pamphlet on this, mm. and it was a lie. And so that's actually why they call that piercing the Prince Albert. Mm. There is no evidence that Prince Albert was actually particularly endowed, mm. nor that he took such drastic measures to tame his unruly member. This is the Richard Gears hamster myth of piercings. Seriously. But it makes for a good story. It does. Although, you know, with that same idea, like if you have just really big feet and you have know, staple gun, like what do you just, nah. yeah, And I don't understand. Like he also must have had a corresponding piercing on his testicles to right. like link it to or something. Because if you just, or maybe the weight was supposed to pull it down. Uh, that I, might be it. I mean, but you can get an erection with a Prince Albert, so it would still rise unless you put like a 10 pound weight on that beach and then yeah, yeah, yeah. Or unless you, you know, had a corresponding. Yeah. yeah. Another piercing. I think this all could have been very easily fixed with a simple thing we've discussed before in another one of our episodes, a cod piece. You just stuff your trousers and yeah. it goes tong every time you're happy around someone. <laughs> just, every time you get aroused, it's like a bell ringing. Yeah. <laughs> it gives, <-ting>. gives, <laughs> gives people, a, you know, a little thrill like, oh, I made Prince Albert happy. Or you could just wear, you know, baggy pants. Yeah. He could have just been born in the 90s and then he would have been fine. Yeah. He would have been sagging and his penis also would have been sagging. Yeah. So anyway, the exhibition was inspired by, and in some ways a response to, the French Industrial Exhibition of 1844. But rather than just showcasing the technology of one nation, as the French had done, Prince Albert proposed inviting foreign countries to participate and encouraging the world to watch. Here is the explanation from the official Hyde Park government website in the UK. Quote, To try and bring everyone together, while also taking a chance to show off just how great Britain was... Prince Albert organized what would come to be known as the First World's Fair. He invited countries from around the world to bring their own exhibits to encourage trade and establish British superiority. I'm sorry. I, I warned you before, like, I'm 12. So the only thing I can think of is exhibitionism on the world scale, and he wants to come out on top. This is essentially the world's biggest orgy for voyeurs, and he just wants to have his whale wang out there for the world to see. I just like that he's inviting all these nations to come so right. that they can then be shown up, bested. Yeah. He's like, come show off all your achievements so that we can belittle them in public. <laughs> Laugh snootily up our sleeves. We're giving you the opportunity to be flexed on in front of the entire world. You're welcome. <laughs> so sweet. Yeah. The exhibition was a resounding success and resulted in a deluge of positive publicity of the approximately 6 million people who eventually attended which was literally a third of the British population at the time. Hmm. Notable attendees included uh, Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, various other Charleses, I'm sure, yeah. the scientist Michael Faraday, and Karl Marx, who reportedly described the World's Fair as a vulgar celebration of capitalism. Lord. Kind of rude. Yeah. No one made you go. Could have stayed home. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like going by a restaurant and being like, I'm not going to eat here, and then leaving. No, but he, he went in. Yeah. It's like eating at the restaurant and then being like, I knew this restaurant was going to be terrible. And I was right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that inaugural World's Fair was sponsored by Schweppes, a company based in Geneva, Switzerland, and creator of the first ever soft drinks, popular back before the Cola Wars took over. Right. And of course, now owned by Coca-Cola, as is everything that's not owned by Pepsi. Right. Yeah. There were some 13,000 items displayed at the fair, and every participating country had their own particular highlights. India, for instance, displayed the Mountain of Light, at the time the world's largest known diamond. That was a very popular exhibit, although I don't really know how that qualifies as a national achievement. It's just a big-ass rock you found. <laughs> we dug this out of the ground, but you didn't make it? You didn't create it? No, but we dug it out of our ground. Yeah, it's like bringing a river. Look at this thing that exists where we are. The New Zealand exhibit featured handcrafted items made by the native Maori people. Hmm. Is that what I say right? Maori, yeah. yeah. The United States submitted Cyrus McCormick's steam-powered reaping machine, a harvester which would massively increase the productivity of farming. Hmm. As for England, among the British exhibitions was an early version of a fax machine. Whoa. Notable for being one of the most annoying devices in history <laughs> and rendered thankfully obsolete by the internet. Yeah. I'm I glad those things are gone. 
God dang. Every single time I see a single one of those pieces of paper or like PDF files that I have to fill out and they're like, fax number. I just want to be like, seriously? Seriously. It's funny. My business cards still have a fax number. We supposedly have a fax machine at my office. I have no idea where it is. Mm. If you have sent me a fax, I never responded and you deserved it. It's so crazy when you call a number today and get that like fax machine sound. Yeah. It's like calling history. Dude, it's like calling the early internet. It's still like... Yeah, it's basically a modem. Yeah. Mm. Another exhibit, the Tempest Prognosticator, a machine that would provide an alert in the event of an approaching storm. This machine was composed of 12 leeches placed in bottles inside a barometer, and when the atmospheric pressure changed due to an approaching storm, the leeches would become agitated and attempt to climb out of the bottles, thus triggering a tiny hammer which would strike a bell. I don't believe a word you're saying. That's 100% true. <laughs> really? Yeah. And in case you were worried about the welfare of the leeches, the leech containers were placed in a circle inside the machine so that the leeches could look at each other to counteract, quote, the affliction of solitary confinement. Wow. I am an animal lover, mm. but even I'm just like, really? It's, is life in a glass vial tolerable now because you can see other animals who are also suffering in glass vials? Yeah, if I'm if I'm ever abducted by aliens and I'm suddenly in a glass vial across from Shane and we're both screaming and pounding on glass, I'm not going to be like, I feel so much better knowing that Shane is also terrified for his life. I guess I kind of would. I really? Think, yeah, I think if I had to be, it's like prison. Mm. Like, I would definitely rather be in a cell, probably not with someone else, mm. but a cell where I could see other prisoners and, like, hear them than, like, isolated in a box somewhere. Mm. I think there is something about shared misery mm. that makes you feel less alone and miserable. So maybe it did help the leeches. I don't know. And they're leeches. I give a fuck. Can a leech see other leeches? How far can a leech see? I didn't even know they could see. I thought they were blind. Yeah. This and is the weirdest this thing. Is, by the way, were they just out of old people? Like arthritis, changes in barometric pressure. It makes your bones ache. Like what you so you, have, you just want to put some old people yes, in some just, vials? Dude. No, I don't know about vials. <laughs> Jesus, man. No, I was just saying pay them to line our coasts and, you know, the... Huh? Storms are coming. No, yeah, that seems much more practical than this ridiculousness. Yeah, let's just pay old people to tell us when they hurt. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would be constant. <laughs> you would always think there was a storm. Where am I sciatica? Also, but do you have to feed the leeches? Like, how long could they go without... Did you just, like, attach them to your arm once a week and then put them back in the vials? See, this is why you do the research, because I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the storm hits and the alarm hadn't gone off. It's just like, who was supposed to feed the leeches? Damn it, Duncan. <laughs> Show me your arm. <laughs> you didn't feed no damn leeches. And besides the fact, how would you know that they weren't just really looking forward to their feeding time if they started getting, you know, yeah, accustomed to it? They'd be like, oh, storm's coming. No, that's just feeding time. Yeah, I think they would get agitated by not eating for months and mm. then would climb out and you'd be like, ah, there's a storm. And there wouldn't be. But then you'd be attacked by a bunch of leeches because now they're out. Attacked sounds a lot more active than I believe leeches is capable. They don't really sprint. They sort of inchworm along, if that. They're very lazy, probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you live on blood, that is your primary source of protein. You're just waiting for the next thing to swim by for blood. So you just hang out on a leaf and hang out. Is it? Or in a vial. Mm, or in a vial, waiting for a storm. So you can go, man, I don't like it. Staring at other leeches, <laughs> other sad leeches. Did, How's it going, Paul? Did they just like wave their little tails at each other and... Another day in the vial. <laughs> they did like little shadow puppets to keep each other entertained. <laughs> I'm now seeing in my head. I don't know why. I'm now seeing Shawshank Redemption, but with <laughs> leeches. I remember the day old Saul came into the vial next door to mine. He said he was innocent. I believed him about as much as I believed every other leech <laughs> sitting beside me in the circle. <laughs> this is... I just, it's amazing to me when we go this far off the rails. <laughs> I'm going to just blame it on the insomnia I had last night. I'm Second on like four hours of sleep. As we discussed in the Darwin Awards episode, the home of the first World's Fair, the Crystal Palace, was eventually destroyed by fire, which is somewhat counterintuitive as this was a building made of glass and iron, but the floor and many of the exhibits and the office areas were constructed of wood. So there's not much left to commemorate the first World's Fair. Hmm. Not a single leech survived. Not a single leech or brain sparrow hawk or sparrow. <laughs> so the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park was an international sensation and inspired a gold rush of World's Fairs or Expos or International Exhibitions or whatever. Mm. There is actually a governing body that authorizes these expositions today, the Bureau International des Expositions, which I'm sure is said much better in whatever language it started in. 
I'm assuming French, was created in 1928 and recognizes four distinct types of expos. Specialized expos, world expos, horticulture expos, and the Milan Triennial, which as you might imagine takes place in Milan, Italy, every three years. Hmm. The most recent version, the 23rd Milan Triennial, was scheduled to run from May 2020 to November of 2022. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the theme for the exposition was, quote, unknown unknowns, what we don't know, we don't know. Unquote. Okay, fire whoever named that A, and B, irony is thick upon the ground, my friend. Now they know. <laughs> yeah. They fucked around and found, found out. out. <laughs> Indeed. You don't know where that quote comes from? Mm -mm. I recognized it immediately. That was Donald Rumsfeld, the George Bush's Secretary of Defense. It's a famous quote. He said, As we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. Stimpy, I'm hurting. That's where that quote comes from. If you didn't know, now you know. Dun, dun, dun. It's a known known. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the notable inventions and landmarks that have been developed for or debuted at World's Fairs. In addition to the Eiffel Tower, which was built for the 1899 Exhibition Universale, as we mentioned, the Space Needle in Seattle was also the product of a World's Fair. Do you know that? Really? Specifically, what? the 1962 World's Fair produced the 600-foot-tall flying saucer on a tower. I've been to the top of it. Hmm. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was not blown away. Always, that, that always seems worse than just being like, it was dumb as fuck. But when you say it, it's fine, it, you sound like a yeah. girlfriend who you just underwhelmingly laid. It's, it, no, it was it was fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, it wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like mediocre sex. It's, mm. it's still not bad, mm. but, you know, it wasn't anything to write home about. I hope you don't write home every time you have good sex either. It'd be awkward. <laughs> Although if you do, your family really needs to get some help. Seriously. <laughs> If you write home at all, like, what do you do? Email. Yeah. Just, even email feels old now. That even felt weird to say. Just text, but not about your sex life to your parents. And don't include pictures. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I always say? Pics or didn't happen. <laughs> the Chicago 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in honor of the 400th anniversary of Columbus sailing the ocean blue, which, as we know, actually happened in 1492, mm. thus the rhyme, Yeah, but whatever, was a notable fair for both its triumphs and clusterfucks. <laughs> Well-known products and items introduced at the fair include the dishwasher. Nice. And slightly less ambitious but equally ubiquitous juicy fruit gum, cream of wheat, Cracker Jacks, shredded wheat cereal, Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. All of the things I enjoy. All of these things are I'm fans of. <laughs> the food groups for yeah. Duncan. <laughs> That's just uh, lunch. How do you feel your stomach? Don't judge me. The Chicago World's Fair was also famous, or I should say notorious, for a couple other reasons as well, and you will recognize this. H.H. H. Holmes famously built his death hotel as a tourist trap in the most literal sense of the word, specifically to ensnare out-of-towners attending the event. Yep. We will cover him eventually, I guarantee it. Yeah. Also, William Cody, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill, had petitioned to host his Wild West show at the fair, and he was rejected. So as a cowboy-style middle finger, he set up his racist tent directly nearby. His racist tent? Officially known as Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Congress of Rough Riders of the World, it was basically a parade of stereotypes and tropes. Uh, Native Americans and Indians and Mongols and Turks in their authentic attire. By Indians, I mean East Indians. Right. And the show featured supposed reenactments and dramatic portrayals of the Indian attacks on heroic white villages. All of the... It was bad. Yeah. The Wild West show proved to be tremendously popular, of course, and siphoned money and visitors from the World's Fair. And the whole situation was a massive money-losing fiasco for the fair's investors up until June when steel magnate George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. delivered the first ever Ferris wheel to the event. The giant wheel carrying seated tourists in a vertigo-inspiring circle was intended to be a tourist attraction to rival the Eiffel Tower. Hmm. I don't I don't think many people have made it their life's goal to visit the big wheel of rotating people in Chicago. Big wheel of six names McGee over there. It did make a crap ton of money, though, hmm. and it saved the fare. The wheel could hold up to 2,150 people at a time. That is a lot. Sweet, ungodly fuck. How big was this thing? It was pretty big. And at 50 cents a ride, it cost twice as much as a ticket to the fair itself. So it did save them financially. I feel like it must have had really big seats and you, you couldn't have been two people at a time. 
Yeah, either that or was, you know, 13,000 feet tall. Like, like <laughs> no, 2,000 people? That would rival the Eiffel Tower. So yeah. I think that it was, it must have been like seven people on a seat, which is just uncomfortable. I don't want to sit that close to strangers. Is going up in a circle. Uh, not into it. Yeah, and back in the day, before there were like really good antibacterial soaps or anything, oh, yeah. Yeah, people were bad. funky. Yeah. Hmm. Some more notable firsts. The 1904 St. Louis World's Fair introduced the world to x-rays, invented by William Conrad Röntgen. Likewise, the Universal Fastener Company debuted a product called the Clasp Locker at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Any idea what that uh, might be? A uh, snapping button? Mm, close. It would eventually become known as the Separable Fastener, but today we refer to it as the zipper. Oh, yeah. That's kind of cool. An early version of FaceTime called the Picture Phone by AT&T debuted at the New York World's Fair in 1964. This is kind of an amazing story. Bell Labs basically created the internet before the internet and then gave up on it because it was too clunky and expensive. So the first patent for a video calling device was actually filed in 1932 in Germany. Fucking Jesus. And video calling booths were set up to connect Nuremberg, Hamburg, and Munich. So we might have had video phones in the first half of the 20th century, but then something happened in the late 1930s, got in the way. It's not coming to me right away. Yeah, I don't remember so what it was. Yeah. So after the war, American phone company Bell Labs adopted the project and created a pretty amazing device. It featured a 5-inch by 5-inch screen. It's bigger than an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Resolution, not quite an iPhone. It was the resolution of a friggin' shadow puppet. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it was like the resolution of an Etch-a-Sketch. Yeah. yeah. You thought 80s cell phones were bad. Like, how much did this thing weigh? A metric ton? Oh, I'm sure it was. It was It was an anchor. Mm. But still, the infrastructure required to transmit video data, it was basically the same as the internet we have today, or at least the same kind of technology. It was like an early version of broadband, and they demonstrated it successfully at the World's Fair, but demand for the product never materialized. Maybe because in 1964 money, the service cost about $150 a minute. Holy heck. It's a lot to shell out to view a grainy image of your grandmother's forehead or ear for 20 minutes. Dude, just imagine as, as much trouble as boomers have figuring out Zoom. Yeah. You're paying for your grandma to figure out that you've just been filming the mole on her chin for the last five minutes. People back then, significantly less tech savvy. And I'm sure, you know, there would be a whole lot of, of uh, spiritual and religious terror going on, too. This is the devil's work. I ain't getting on the talking box. It captures your soul. Right. Yeah. right. At that same World's Fair, RCA debuted Color Television. The Radio Corporation of America set up a pavilion in which fairgoers would be filmed and their images projected in color on TV screens that they could view in real time. It is, it's interesting to think of, you know, this was a time when 99% of people had never seen themselves on a screen hmm. or like in video. Hmm. So they got to feel like TV stars for just a brief moment before realizing that the camera adds 10 pounds and then <laughs> immediately noticing in detail all of their physical flaws and coming to the realization that they could never be a TV star. And they probably left emotionally crushed hmm. and thus insecurities and body dysmorphia were born. Yes, and, you know, this is how far we've come because you can now just walk by a TV store and do the exact same thing. Well, now we have Instagram. You can just right. feel terrible about yourself uh, in your own pocket yes. all the time. This is a little, little ball of awful. <laughs> Thanks, World Fairs. Oh. Speaking of screens, the first ever touchscreen debuted at the Knoxville, Tennessee World's Fair in 1982, invented by Dr. Samuel Hurst, and there'd be no iPhone without that breakthrough. That was the same fair that introduced the world to a truly innovative and world-changing product, Cherry Coke. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Coke actually developed a bunch of different flavors for the World's Fair. And even today, you can find variations like vanilla and lime and raspberry and orange overseas. Hmm. But Cherry proved to be the most popular at the fair. And so history was made. They released it. Not every product introduced to the World's Fair was a hit. And not every fair was a success. Let's talk about some of the more notorious face palms and misfires. Oh, please do. The 1931 fair in Paris was particularly cringeworthy. Remember we talked about those specialized expos? Mm. It was colonialism themed. Essentially a celebration of the plunder of Asian and African countries. Oh, sweet Jesus. It has been described as a classic human zoo situation in which so-called natives were shipped in from their home countries and placed in heavily stereotyped human-sized dioramas and encouraged to act as much like caricatures as possible to the delight of fair visitors. Oh, dear God. I'm also picturing 
Remember that uh, mountain of light? <laughs> They're like, we stole this. Remember when it was here <laughs> years ago? It's now ours. Yay, colonialism. <laughs> Thank you, India. Yeah, here's all the uh, wonders of the Orient, uh, <laughs> which we now sell for 10 cents in our gift shop. Yeah. Chip off the mountain of light. Chip off the mountain <laughs> of light. 10 pence. Ouch. The bleak and exploitive nature of this fair did not go unnoticed in its day. An offshoot of the Soviet Communist Party actually staged a nearby counter-programming event titled Truth on the Colonies, built to expose the exploitation of foreign nations by the colonial powers. So while the Paris Colonial Exposition attracted some 9 million visitors over its 8-month span, the competing communist fair attracted around uh, 5,000 in that time frame. Slight discrepancy. Yeah. Just like a... You know, three orders of magnitude. <laughs> Apparently, Europeans found the idea of watching foreign natives pretending to enjoy their subjugation much more appealing than paying for a guilt trip. Weird, that. A well-deserved one, but, yeah. you know, people rarely want to face their conscience for a fee. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would pay $50 to go into a fair and have someone yell about my white privilege and all the rest of the shit that I enjoy, sadly. Yeah, it's just not in me. Come visit Disney's newest park, Shameland. <laughs> it's the saddest place on earth. <laughs> Every drink comes with a free antidepressant. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't all go, mm. but we're not going to. No. And we're definitely not going to pay for it. Right. As that one actress in that one movie, One Time, One Said, what's my motivation? <laughs> so we've talked about the World's Fair in New York in the 1960s. There was also one in New York back in 1939, and it showcased its own crop of world-changing breakthroughs, like the seven-foot-tall smoking robot Electro. What? Like actually smoked cigars? It smoked cigarettes. Mm. Yeah. Created by the Westinghouse Company, Electro was accompanied by a robot dog named Sparko, who was capable of sitting and begging, kind of. Mm. None of these advertised abilities involve anything we would think of today as true robotics. Mm. For instance, to deliver commands to the robot, you would pick up the telephone handset installed in its chest and deliver a series of prepared statements Quote, as described in the History of Computers website, each command word set up vibrations that were converted into electrical impulses, which in turn operated the relays controlling 11 motors. A series of correctly spaced words determined each movement that Electro was to make, unquote. So obviously Electro couldn't interpret the actual meaning of words, hmm. and to be fair, neither can Siri, like 60% of the time. But to say that Electro was rudimentary was an understatement. Right. Each word was converted into a flash of light, and Electro performed actions based on the number of light flashes. So it didn't matter what you said, it all came down to how many words you used. Hmm. Electro could also supposedly walk, and if you watch videos of this thing, it was pretty ballsy of Westinghouse to make that claim. Hmm. Props for audacity. Hmm. The robot had rollers on its feet, and it would slide around while sort of repeatedly bending a knee. It hmm. was unconvincing. <laughs> Electro could speak 700 pre-recorded words thanks to a series of old-school record players embedded in its body, like actual turntables. Wow. Telephone relays and electric motors allowed the robot to convert commands into basic actions, like turning on the small bellows in its mouth so that it could, quote, smoke a cigarette. Mm. I love how when humans get to play God, we immediately program our worst impulses into our creations. This robot can uh, have an affair with your wife, steal your children away, and probably wreck your car. Our newest model humanoid robot. It's self-powered, autonomous, and racked with self-hatred. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, play a clip of a demonstration of Electro. Hmm. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a great deal of pride and pleasure, I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. You see, all I need to do is to speak into this phone, and Electro does exactly what I tell him to do, sometimes. But I don't see why I'm telling Electro's story when he's perfectly able to tell his own. So let's listen and see what Electro has to say to us today. All right, Electro, will you tell your story, please? Who? Me? Yes, you. Okay, toots. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be very glad to tell my story. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain. 
of 48 electrical relays. It works just like a telephone switchboard. If I get a wrong number, I can always blame the operator. Thank you. And by the way, I see a lot of good numbers out in our audience today. Electro, behave yourself. Quiet, please. I'm doing the talking. You get the idea. Yeah. My favorite part is that his voice, like it's, he does the stereotypical robot voice. Yeah. But these were just pre-recorded messages. Yeah. Like the dude who made them could have rapped or scatted. Like it could have been it. It didn't need to be like, I am going yeah. to talk to you now. Yeah. It could have just been like, hey, everybody, I'm Electro. Beep, boop, boop. You know, like it just it could have been anything. What's funny to me also is that the, the guy, the quote unquote operator, is talking like Electro before Electro talks. Well, you could you have to see the video. So he lifts yeah. up the like handset in Electro's chest. Yeah. And then he has to say them that way so that there is space in between each word to make the little flashes of light. Right. But it's 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 robot being <laughs> imitated by robot. Yeah. It, it, they should have had one of his responses being like, Are you mocking me? <laughs> <Yeah>, totally. <laughs> you prick. <laughs> Surprisingly, once again, it turned out there wasn't a huge demand for a telephone-chested smoking robot. Electro was quickly retired and is now on display at the Mansfield Memorial Museum in Ohio, where it is billed as the oldest surviving American robot in the world. Hmm. Playing kind of fast and loose with the definition of the word surviving. And robot, but sure. Yeah, true. (laughs) Another oddity, the previously referenced New York World's Fair of 1964 featured a working jetpack invented by Bell Aerosystems known as the Bell Rocket Belt. It used five gallons of concentrated explosive hydrogen peroxide to achieve its lift, and the peroxide nozzles could be tilted for steering. It was actually very maneuverable. I have to admit it's pretty cool looking in the video. I don't know if you've seen some of these. Mm -mm. I'm kind of surprised that it never took off. I guess there is a reason. Uh, The rocket could stay aloft for a total of exactly 21 seconds. (laughs) That is a long jump. You could use it to, like, uh, hop over a puddle. Yeah. It worked really well. Hmm. Just, you know, make sure that you got a good watch. Yeah. And keep an eye <laughs> on that timer. Make sure that stopwatch is hanging off your glasses. It'd be great if you just, like, wanted to break someone out of prison. Mm. And you just, like, toss this thing over the wall. And then they just, pshoo. I don't know if I would want to toss anything that contains the word hyper explosive yeah. and peroxide. That just seems like, yeah. here, catch. Lower it slowly over the wall. Yeah. Yeah. These things still exist. They've been unretired every now and then for like uh, movies and Olympic ceremonies. Hmm. Uh, they've been used at Disneyland and in various films like the 1965 James Bond film Thunderball. Hmm. Uh, the cameos are always, you know, brief. <laughs> Around 21 seconds, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, very fun to watch for a very short amount of time. So yet another banger from the 1964 New York Fair Underwater hotels. The General Motors Corporation offered their solution for land overcrowding with a sub-oceanic resort, which took the form of tiny pods shaped like flying saucers stapled to the bottom of the ocean. Hey kids, ever wanted to feel like you're going to die any second? Well, we've got a glass pod with your name on it. Also commonly known as My Worst Nightmare. Yeah. Thanks, I hate it. We won't revisit all my neuroses, but mm. yeah, this is no bueno. <laughs> Sums up a couple. Pretty good. Two additional facts about that New York World's Fair before we dispense with it completely. The It's a Small World ride, which we referenced before from Disneyland, debuted there before being relocated to Southern California. And also the natural gas industry reserved an entire pavilion to showcase recent and upcoming innovations. The pavilion was called the Festival of Gas. <laughs> That aged well. <laughs> like these are both rides you would find at Shameland. Yeah. <laughs> the saddest place on earth. <laughs> it's a Small World is a nightmare. I hate that ride. Have you been on it? No, I've never been on it, but I've only heard horror stories. God, all those creepy little singing puppets or whatever. They mm-hmm. just, I'd, I'd go to the Festival of Gas before I... <laughs> it's a Small World. Maybe it's Laughing Gas. They could be fun. You don't know. I don't know what kind of gas. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you were on nitrous gas and had being sung at by a lot of little tiny creepy little puppets, it would make it worse. Yeah, you can go on the laughing gas, then you get in the It's a Small World ride, and you're never the same. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a debriefing from the NSA. <laughs> 
Some more quick ones. Philadelphia's Centennial Exposition of 1876 featured the hand of the Statue of Liberty. Like, not the entire statue, just the hand holding the torch. Hmm. It's basically a sneak preview of the larger work in progress taking place in France. So you could gaze on the majesty of a woman's severed hand. H.H. H. Holmes would have enjoyed that exhibit. Yes. You could also sample, most likely for the first time, a banana. The fruit had been only recently introduced to America and was initially served with a knife and fork. Huh. Banana eaters, very dignified back then. It's not like us savages of today, just... Peeling and nomming. With no implements whatsoever. I'm sure for one of you... Uh... Pinky extended hose. It's it's very hard to deal with. That made me laugh in the last episode. <laughs> Pinky extending hose. Also, the Philadelphia Exposition featured such common sense items as powdered root beer and the portable bathtub. It was constructed of rubberized cloth. I don't know what that is. And doubled as a suitcase. Rubberized cloth, to me, sounds like that shit you put, like, you know, when you go to old style burger joints and they had that nasty stuck to your arm kind of material on over the, the tables. Like a diaper. Yeah. Quote, be it known that I, Ethelbert Watts of Philadelphia, in the county of Philadelphia and state of Pennsylvania, have invented a certain new and useful convertible bathtub. The object of my invention is to provide a valise, traveling bag, or other equivalent article used for the transportation of clothing, which shall be convertible into a bathtub, so as to afford travelers in places where such conveniences are wanting the luxury or comfort of bodily ablution. I was an English major. I didn't even know that one. Yeah, I, I do know, like, your daily ablutions. I, I knew that one, but mm. I, not a single part of me hears that sentence and goes, yeah, this is going to go far. Well, you might mock old Ethelbert Watts, uh, but I looked it up. You can buy an inflatable bathtub online today. I will provide a link to the portable standalone bathtub by the Satinia Company. It is normally $500, but you can get it right now on sale for $299. It's a steal. Cheap at twice the price. Along with all of the awesome descriptions of the benefits of this product, quote, due to its small and compact size, all of the water inside our large foldable tub stays concentrated on one specific area of the body. This causes all of the muscles to relax and release the tension within minutes. Unquote. Call it what it is. This is a ball washer. Yeah. <laughs> you just stick your ass in this and you're like, ah, I am now relaxed. And if you order now, you can have yours within two to five weeks. You're only a month away from transportable ablution. I love <laughs> I love that, you know, you can say transportable, but I mean, with enough cranes, anything is transportable. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So before we go, I feel like I should bring up the fact that I have attended one of these fairs. Really? As a little kid in the circus, when I was in the Pickle Family Circus, I actually attended the last World's Fair held in North America, Expo 86 in Vancouver, Canada. Huh. The official name was the World Exposition on Transportation and Communication, and the theme was transportation and communication world in motion world in touch that was a lot why are all of these names ridiculously and pointlessly long just to make it sound important hmm. the event was budgeted for 78 million canadian dollars but expenses end up totaling over 800 million oh. and canada lost over 300 million on the deal but that does not include the money that flowed into the local economy from tourists which was in the billions so overall the area did pretty well nice one notorious factoid from that final North American World's Fair, anticipating a massive influx of money and tourists, in the lead-up to the event, Vancouver hotels evicted over a thousand low-income residents with practically zero notice. In some cases, residents were given a week or less to move. These expos, they're very similar to, like, Olympic ceremonies. Mm. Countries host them for publicity, and they can bring an influx of tourism, but they also are massive drains on resources and hugely disruptive to the area. Yeah, and I mean, fuck, the Chinese one was abandoned almost immediately, wasn't it? It's now just a ruin. You mean like the Olympic Village? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, as you've seen, though, like, you know, the Eiffel Tower, the Space Needle, some of these things end up becoming these big tourist attractions that remain cash cows for years. Mm. So it depends. The mm. ROI is hit and miss, mm. I would say. Another low point for Expo 86, the one that I went to, mm. this is my favorite. Mm. Both the American and Soviet pavilions, their premier exhibits, were epic examples of poor timing. Hmm. The theme chosen for the American pavilion was, quote, a celebration of space travel, unquote. 
Of course, the theme was selected and the pavilion constructed far in advance, so it was too late to make any changes when uh, four months before Expo 86 opened, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds into its flight, killing all seven of the astronauts on board. Fuck. The casualties included Krista McAuliffe, a high school social studies teacher who had been selected from over 11,000 applicants as winner of the Teacher in Space project. Do you remember this? Yeah, I do remember this. And there's a really bad joke coming to my mind that I'm not going to say. This is probably for the best. Yeah. It was a big publicity stunt. McAuliffe was touted as the first ordinary person to be sent to space, and it riveted the nation. The nation was equally riveted by the image of the shuttle incinerating like a Roman candle. Yeah, it was more like a, one of those little bottle rockets you shoot off. It was, oh. it was so scary. The teacher never made it to space. The disaster occurred at only 46,000 feet, and space doesn't start until you hit the Karman line, or Karman line, mm. which is about 300,000 feet up in the air. And the whole situation was just horrific and traumatizing for America as a whole, and certainly for my third grade class that was watching it live. Yeah. Teachers quickly switched off the TVs, and the rest of the day was awkward. <laughs> Not to be outdone, the Soviet pavilion was in equally poor taste. It was a celebration of the Soviet Union's nuclear program. Do you have any guess as to what happened six days before the expo opened on the 26th of April, 1986? Uh, no, I don't know. Does the word Chernobyl ring a bell? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Less than a week before the USSR opened a giant pavilion celebrating its nuclear program, there was a catastrophic meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine. <laughs> Just... Can you imagine having to work that pavilion? You had to keep a smile on your face and hype up the benefits of nuclear energy as irradiated ash rained down on children and puppies and shit wow. back in your home country. Right. Or you could wander over to the U.S. side and be like, ah, you blowing up any good teachers lately? <laughs> yeah, I think they just they just probably sniped at each other from across the way. They're like, well, you know, well, at least we didn't destroy an ecosystem. Right. <laughs> and they were like, how are your teachers doing? Yeah. <laughs> so that was World's Fairs. And uh, by the way, I want to give a shout out to my new research minion, Llama Trauma from Discord. She volunteered to take a little bit of the burden off of yours truly. And so she sends me a lot of uh, links to things and kind of brings up things I might not have thought of otherwise. She's a smoking robot. She mm. sent me that link. That was cool. Llama, 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 trauma. That's your song. There That's you like... go. You have your own song. Your song kind of sucks. I'm sorry about that. But... <laughs> Dick. <laughs> you know, you didn't come up with a song. Maybe there will be a Mark II of that song. It's a work in progress. Llama. That's better. <laughs> so thank you to Llama. We also have a new patron to shout out, a Woo. Midnight Maniac, the highest tier. Thank you to Backback1310, B-A-K-B-A-K. -B -A -K. I'm always fascinated by people's usernames. Sounds like an African antelope or something. Yeah, or just a really aggressive chicken. Back, back. A herd of backbacks. <laughs> And a quick review this week from The Vault, a blast from the past. We have some new ones to get to, but I don't want to neglect the insomniacs who've been with us from the beginning. we got to dip into the mailbag every now and then. Mm. This one was from March 2020, way back when we didn't know what we were in for with the pandemic. This was pre-COVID, mm. how innocent and naive we all were. Aww. It's five stars, and it says, Loving the topics these guys talk about, and you guys sound amazing. That was B one from Australia. Oh, Maddie. Oh, thanks, Maddie. Appreciate you. Even the reviews sounded innocent and hopeful back then. <laughs> I'm betting six months later, Maddie B01 was like, fuck the world, <laughs> fuck quarantine, <laughs> fuck your podcast. <laughs> your podcast can suck a <laughs> dick. <laughs> all right. So you guys all know the deal. And uh, I swear, I know I've been lagging, but uh, Babs, at least the Babs Mark 1, where it's just one Bab. Uh, that shirt will be out in the next couple of weeks. I've already scanned the bloody thing. I just need to clean up the image and put it on a shirt. It looks proper insane. And then I just need to design the font for the front and you will have shirts. So visit our stores, grab our merch, go to the Instagram, give Shane some love, go to the Discord and just share the chaos and lunacy and wackaloonery. Wack I can't speak. And then, as per usual and forever after, knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. 